thank you, Greg, and all the board members from the Jackson Center. And thank you also, those of you in the audience, for braving what looks like it's going to be the first snow <laughs> of this season. I've got to tell you, though, that uh, this is really an honor for me, uh, as, as grateful as I am for the invitation, the opportunity to speak before you. I'm also humbled because Robert Jackson, to me, is somebody that has been an inspiration. Long before I was a lawyer, I studied the, uh, the works and the trials of some of the masters. As a matter of fact, I still have a volume on the Nuremberg trial. And uh, Jackson's opening and closing statements were generally regarded, <clears throat> at least uh, in that day, and I can tell you still to this day, as probably some of the finest oratorical presentations that have been given by an American trial lawyer. Just to give you a, a further idea, I put him almost in the same league as Daniel Webster, who's also uh, a, quite an uh, inspiration to me when it comes to trial abilities and trial talents. Most folks may not know that Jackson did more than just prosecute the Nazi threat at Nuremberg. He actually wrote um, some cases and sat on others that uh, spoke about the role of government and the need to prosecute people, sometimes not just for acts, but also for attempts to motivate a crowd to commit violence. And um, as a justice, as a lawyer, he certainly sets a very high standard. As a matter of fact, you heard the introduction, I'm a United States attorney. Jackson actually had reached the pinnacle of the Department of Justice where I serve, and that was as Attorney General of the United States. So at every stage of his career, uh, he's somebody that I look to and, and I continue to look to, frankly, for guidance as to how I can best serve you as your United States Attorney. When it comes to the threat of terrorists, most people know of the Lackawanna Six, which was one of the cases that I had prosecuted over the years. And by way of background, that was the first known instance of American citizens leaving the shores of the United St States to train with Osama bin Laden. The case was significant for a number of reasons, not least of which was the fact that we caught people that had aligned themselves with a foreign power, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And if you remember, there was an authorization for the use of military force, which Congress passed shortly after 9-11, which really gave the president the power to use all force necessary against nations, organizations, and individuals that aided the terrorist attacks. Well, fortunately, a decision was made at the highest levels to bring that case to court. And as you know, all of the Lackawanna six defendants were convicted, and they all were sentenced to between seven and 10 years in jail. What isn't known sometimes, however, is that each of these men ended up cooperating with the government. And by cooperation, I mean not just debriefings and sitting with agents such as Special Agent Brent Isaacson of the FBI, but getting back to the story of the Lackawanna Six, these folks all testified, cooperated, provided leads, provided debriefings, and really gave most of the Western powers who fight terrorists as our allies unique insights as to how the indoctrination process was conducted, the infiltration and exfiltration process of how somebody goes about attending one of these terrorist training camps and then actually identifying the sort of ideas and training that was being uh, promoted at the time our Lackawanna Six uh, people were in attendance at this terrorist training camp known as Al Farouk. And the one thing I'll say in not arguing for or against criminal courts to prosecute terrorists versus the Guantanamo Bay model or the commission model or the Nuremberg trial model is this. 
There was, in fact, another man at the same time as the Lackawanna six guys were being prosecuted, who, in fact, was prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced during the Guantanamo Bay military commission process. And of course, the person I'm speaking of is Salim Hamden, who was the driver of Osama bin Laden. Now, what you need to know, and uh, it's probably common sense, but we should just uh, elaborate a little bit for purposes of this talk, is that not just anybody can be selected to be the driver of Osama bin Laden. He did not use cab drivers or anybody other than a person who would have been a highly trusted, highly placed within the organization member of Al-Qaeda. Salim Hamdan, after trial, after conviction, and with all of this evidence of his role as the driver of bin Laden, he was sentenced and served five and a half years in jail. Five and a half years in jail. The Lackawanna six defendants, on the other hand, whose conduct consisted of training with and only spending between two weeks and at the outside six weeks with Osama bin Laden, and then who came home from the United States and simply stopped or terminated their involvement in the organization, and who, by the way, cooperated fully even after conviction and sentencing, the least one of those defendants received was seven years in jail, and others received as much as 10 years in jail. Not so when it comes to commissions and judges there, because there's frankly been so little work done on that. We, of course, know about uh, Nuremberg and how that turned out, and I understand that Justice Jackson was frankly even surprised by some of the sentences that were imposed by the judges. And then I guess the last piece is this. If in fact it is the country that's at war against terrorists, I for one strongly believe that the American citizenry should weigh in on what should be the fate of these terrorists. And the way our citizens do that under our system of justice is the jury trial. In a military commission, the jurors are picked in a different way, and there always is the possibility of an acquittal. At Nuremberg, I understand three men were acquitted, but we are certainly coming up to the point now where uh, there may be, uh, right, no ifs, ors, ands, or buts, the opportunity to decide for future cases. Do they go commission? Do they go criminal trial? And now you know, you have a little bit more information, I hope, by which you can evaluate what would be the right approach. As a matter of fact, just two weeks ago, Umar Abdul Muttalib, uh, the underwear bomber who was trying to blow up Flight 253 as it was landing in Detroit on Christmas Day 2009, he just was convicted of providing material support. One of many ways in which we can hold people in jail and sentence them for doing something on behalf of Al-Qaeda, even if, as was the case of Umar Abdul Muttalib, he had nothing to do with the attacks of 9-11, but much, much later, eight years later, joined the ideology, if you will, and then attempted to kill all those Americans. So that is the, uh, the, the sphere of terrorism. It's highly nuanced, many complexities, and it's an area that we consider of number one priority, uh, certainly in Western New York. The leading law enforcement agency is certainly the FBI, and the FBI just is working around the clock in order to keep all of you safe, along with your local partners, local law enforcement officers, county, state, and other federal agencies. We all meet on what we call the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and it's not just a matter of connecting dots. Frankly, it's a matter of getting even more dots from all of these agencies and all of these leads so that we can get a better picture to keep you safe. So thank you uh, so much for that brief uh, introduction into our office. Um, we worked very hard, and uh, perhaps through some of the questions, we'll, uh, we'll be able to share a little bit more with you. Thank you very much.